Hello there and welcome to the tutorial video that's going to go through the Edexcel large data set. So to give you some background, each exam board sets its own data set for students to develop their understanding and knowledge in how to deal with data presented on an Excel spreadsheet. In this Edexcel set of data, we're going to have a look at the key features of the large data set and how we can analyse the data using Excel and GeoGebra. So let's jump right into it then. So the objectives of this tutorial are to play learn and then pause and do and what I mean by that is I want the video to be on the side of your screen with the Excel spreadsheet up there and I'll show you how to do the features and then you can perform them on your own spreadsheet. It will give you an experience at handling large data and this is a real life skill as well it will teach you how to calculate statistics in uh, in Excel spreadsheets and that's going to be useful for when you go and get jobs in the future and you have to analyze your own data this is going to be a real-life skill you're developing here not just something that's required for the exam board I'll then expect you to answer questions using the large data set and I'm not going to be giving you the answers because I don't want you to just watch this video pl uh, placidly and just learn what the answers are I want you to have some real experience of dealing with the spreadsheets and how to calculate statistics from the large data set and then at the end of this video, I'm going to link to a playlist of videos that go through questions that involve the large data set from exams. So you can see how the large data set is tested in an exam situation. So just to give you some background information on the large data set, we have two different time periods and we've got weather uh, statistics between May and October for five different places in the UK and three different places abroad. So we've got Le Chars, Leeming, Heathrow, Hearn and Camborne. We have some statistics on the data between May and October in two years, 1987 and 2015. And you can see where this, this data set is kind of going. It's looking for global warming and it can allow you to test the effects of global warming on these weather statistics for these five places here and these three places abroad. So, so some important information here. So Le Charles and Leeming are further north than Heathrow, Hearn and Camborne and generally it's colder up north. Um, we have Camborne, Hearn and Le Charles that are by the seaside so it's probably going to be windier by the seaside and we also have Jacksonville, Beijing in the northern hemisphere but Perth is in the southern hemisphere so during the course of May to October Perth is actually going to be in winter during that time period so expect Perth not to be the sunny Perth that we're used to seeing on the TV expect it to be in winter okay so this is what the large data set will look like and we've got lots of different statistics for each place for each time period. So this is the data set for Camborne, May to October 1987. I'm going to get stuck into that soon, but you can see there's lots of different variables that we have for the large data set. So let's go into what all of these uh, headings mean. So in the first case, we have daily mean temperature, and this is measured in degrees Celsius. It's measured as the mean temperature from 9 a.m. Uh, the day that it's measuring to 9 a.m. the next day. Um, but during the course of this vid uh, during the course of this time period, that's going to be 10 a.m. British summer time the following day. Uh, a reading which is not available is recorded as N slash A and there's different reasons why a data, data value wouldn't be recorded maybe the measuring instrument wasn't up to running at that point um, maybe there was uh, difficulties in recording the data maybe the data wasn't recorded but the measuring instrument was set up etc etc there's lots of different reasons why the way that we're going to be dealing with any data that is just N slash A is we're just going to delete it from the data set in the cleaning up process. And moving on to the next variable which is daily total rainfall. Now this is actually measured in two different ways. In the UK it's measured in millimetres and what happens is measuring instruments such as this one here collects the rainfall, it goes through to a funnel on the bottom and then the amount of rain uh, collected is measured at the end of the day and then tipped away afterwards. But actually in Beijing, Jacksonville and Perth rainfall is measured in time that it was raining for so there must be some benchmark of which they will accept yes it's raining now and then they'll collect the time period that it was raining for so it might be two hours of rain that day for example 
if you see TR on a spreadsheet, then this means that it is a, um, a value in between 0 to 0 0.05 millimetres for the UK set of data. Um, and uh, it's just not much rain happened in that time period. But if there was no rainfall, then this actually is measured as 0. So they don't measure accurately between 0 to 0 0.05. They just refer to this as trace, TR for trace. But if it is zero, they will actually say zero rainfall for that day. Moving on to the next variable, this is daily total sunshine. Uh, this is measured by an instrument that measures the amount of solar radiation exceeding a threshold. And it's recorded in the number of hours by the tenths of an hour. So for example, it might be 4.7 hours. Uh, so it's four hours and seven tenths of an hour after that. So um, so that's not the total brightness for the day, that's not the total time that it was daytime, it's just how sunny was it, how much time that day was there sunshine above a certain threshold. So it's not the total length of the day, it's total sunshine. Moving on to the next one is daily maximum relative humidity. And this is measured as how close the air is to being saturated with water vapour. Uh, anything above 95% is associated with mist or fog. I don't think that 100% is like water. It's just completely saturated with water vapour. Okay, 95% or above is mist or fog. On the next one, it's to do with wind. So it's daily mean wind speed, daily maximum gust, daily mean wind direction and daily maximum gust direction. And it is the daily mean wind speed is measured in knots and a knot is approximately 1.15 miles per hour. It's measured from uh, midnight from one day to midnight another day. Uh, unlike the one of the previous variables, which was from 9 a.m. to 9 a.m., the temperature one. Uh, the direction is measured in a bearing and daily mean wind speed is also converted using a Beaufort scale. Now the Beaufort scale is this scale here, so knots is on along the top, so if you've got for example 30 knots, then on the Beaufort scale this would be near a gale, and actually it's not measured in a number on the spreadsheet, it's measured in these phrases, so that's not numerical data that we can analyse, it's um, word is data um, stored in word form so we're not going to be analyzing that mathematically but just so you're aware that this is the kind of um, conversion scale we then move on to daily mean cloud cover and this is measured in octars so an octar is one eighth of the sky currently covered in cloud so two octars would be a quarter Four octars would be half the cloud, half the sky covered in cloud, and they take a mean of this throughout the day. So they might make an observation every 15 minutes and then take a mean of that um, at the end of the day. The next one is daily mean visibility, which is measured in decameters, and one decameter is 10 meters. So I think what they must do is they must set up the same object every day and then periodically throughout the day and they'll take a mean of this data is that they will see the greatest distance of which that object can be seen and recognized in daylight or at night could be seen and recognized if the general illumination were raised to daylight level. So visibility here is measured in decameters. And moving on to the final one, which is daily mean pressure. Uh, hedge pressure is measured in hectopascals. And I didn't quite know what pressure was, so I googled it. What is pressure in weather? Um, pressure is called atmospheric pressure or air pressure. It is the force exerted on a surface by the air above it as gravity pulls it to the earth. Atmospheric pressure is commonly measured with a barometer. Meteorologists describe the atmospheric pressure by how high the mercury is. So what we'll see later is we'll see what the correlation between hectopascals or daily mean pressure and other variables to see if we can see there's some correlation between hectopascals and try and get a bit more of a sense for this variable here. Now something you need to bear in mind is that the data for the UK uh, five cities is different from the data from the three international cities. We'll just we'll just explore the data in a couple of seconds. But we've got tons of data for the UK cities, and we've only got five bits of data for Beijing, Jacksonville, and Perth. 
So how do you get your hands on the large data sets? Well, what I want you to do now is I want you to Google Edexcel large data set maths A level. I want you to click on the first link and it should be an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if you've if you're taken onto a link onto another page, then come back. It should be able to give you a link straight to an Edexcel, uh, so an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, let's move on to the first section then, which is cleaning the data. Okay, so this is our first live look at the large data set. In the first tab, what we have is we have the tabs down the bottom here. This is just an introduction sheet. So it introduces you to all the different variables and gives you the Edexcel definition of all of these different variables and gives you an idea of where the cities are on, on the globe. So let's move on to the first tab of data and each of the different tabs of data um, correspond to different places and potentially in different years as well. Now the first cleaning up process we need to do is get rid of all of these data values that have n slash a in them. Now when we find a mean of this column here it won't be able to do it if we have n slash a in that column because that is a word, that is not a numerical value, this is a text phrase. So what we'll do is we'll just delete anything that has n slash a in it. So what I'll do is I'll go up to the top right of my screen and go to select and find. I'll go to find and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on replace. So I'm going to replace n slash a and in fact I want a few more options with this so I'll select options. I want to replace it with nothing so I'm just going to leave it blank there. I'm going to want to replace n slash a with nothing in the whole workbook not just this sheet I don't want to have to do it multiple times and I want it to be a match the entire cell contents because in some other cell contents it does explain what n slash a is and I wouldn't want to delete that I just want to delete it when the whole cell has the value n slash a so let's now um, replace all and there we are, we've made 402 replacements of all the n slash a's in our data set um, which is going to make finding a mean a lot easier Let's now close that one. And the next thing that we need to do to clear up our data set is with this TR. So again, we're going to go through the same process. Now remember that trace was in between 0 to 0 0.05. So what are we going to want to replace trace with? We don't want to replace it with nothing because it is actually something. But we, maybe what we might do is we might replace it with the middle of this interval. So something like 0 0.025. That would make sense, wouldn't it? So let's go up to find then and we'll go to the same options we had before. Replace. So this time we're going to replace TR with 0.025 in the whole work workbook and we're going to match the entire cell contents with TR and replace it with 0 0.025. So let's again replace, replace, click replace all and there we are, we've made 323 replacements of TR with 0 0.025. And there we are, we're done on that one then. Okay, so it's your turn now everyone, pause this video and have a go at doing those two tasks on your spreadsheets. So in the next section, I'm going to show you a few helpful tips and tricks in presenting your spreadsheet. So let me show you a little bit of an issue I have with my data set at the moment. When I scroll down on my spreadsheet and then I get down to the somewhere in the middle, I can't actually remember what each of these columns represented. So I'll have to scroll back up again and have a look and then scroll back down and it's a bit fiddly to deal with. But let me show you what I've done with Heathrow from May to October. I've fixed the top row so that when I scroll down, that top row is still there and I can still have a look at my data down below. So let me go back up and let me show you how to do it with Camborn. Now the first thing you'll need to do is you'll need to hide these five cells here. Not delete them, just hide them. So if you ever need them in the future, you can unhide them, but we're going to hide them here. Now the next thing we're going to do is with this top pane here, this top row here, I'm going to go to View and then I'm going to go to freeze panes and then freeze the top row and that's going to really help me when I scroll down on my data 
to still be able to look at the data down below, but still understand what this data column is representing. Okay, so that was pretty helpful. Now it's your turn. Pause and do that on your spreadsheet and do it for all the tabs to make your life easier as we go ahead. Okay, so let's move on to the next section now. The next section is calculating some statistics and we're gonna get the Excel spreadsheet to do all of that for us. So let me show you how to do it. Right, so let's get on to calculating statistics then. We're gonna to want to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the lower quartile, the upper quartile, and the median for all of this data set here. So what I'll do then is I'll scroll down to the bottom, scroll, 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 and I'm gonna to get to this point here. Now, NA is not uh, data available, TR is 0 0.05, yeah, we all know that, so we'll just select them and delete them. And we'll set up some uh, headings. So the first column, first row will be mean. The next row will be standard deviation. The next row will be uh, the minimum. The next row will be the lower quartile. The next one will be the uh, median. The next one we'll do might be the upper quartile. And the last one we might do is the maximum. Okay, so let's. Okay, so let's just now adjust that row there a little bit and let's put them all in the middle. So we'll just select them all and put them all in the middle. Right, okay, so how do we calculate the mean? Well, we're going to use a little bit of coding for this and let me show you how to do that. First of all, press the equals button and then type in average. And we just assume that the average here is going to be the mean. So we'll open the brackets, and now what we've got to do is type all of our data into these brackets. Well, that would take quite long, but let me show you a little shortcut. If you just select the bottom cell and drag your way up to the top cell where you want to work out your, me your mean of, and then with the top line here with the code line, just close your brackets and then hit return, it will calculate the mean of all of that data for you. So look at the code there. Let me show you it again so you can copy it down maybe. Really helpful little bit of code that calculates the mean for all of that data. We'll do something similar with standard deviation, but obviously we'll have to use a little bit of a different code. If we press equals and then start to type in uh, standard deviation, it's going to give us std dot p and what dot p stands for is the population so the standard deviation of the population if you can s t d e v dot p so it's just giving you some, some suggestions there and again we'll select the bottom one and scroll our way all up to the top so all the way up to b7 and we'll use the code line to finish the bracket on that and hit return and we get our standard deviation which is 2.87. The next one is the minimum so we'll just hit equals and then min and then it's going to be of the data from we know the code now it's going to be b7 colon to b190 and we'll enter we'll uh, finish the brackets there and press enter. Now the lower quartiles is a bit more difficult let's press equals and then q u a r Ah, we've got quartile here, so T-I-L-E. Open the brackets. Now again, we want to go from B7 to B190. So you B7 and then a colon, B190. And then press comma on this one here. It's a little bit more difficult, this one. Comma, and we want the first quartile, so we'll press number one. Excel's pretty good here. It will give you some hints and tips as you go along writing your code to work out your uh, lower quartile here. So we'll press one, and one is referring to Q1, or the lower quartile. We'll close the brackets and press enter, and we give a, we're given the lower quartile. Let's use exactly the same feature for the median as well. So we'll press equals quartile, open brackets, B7 to B190, comma, we want the second quartile there, so we'll press 2, finish our brackets, and press enter, and then exactly the same with the last one, quartile, B7 to B190, comma, 3, for the third quartile, close the brackets, and we have the upper quartile. On the maximum, we could use the quartiles one, or we could just use equals max, of our data, so B7 to B190. Close the brackets, and we get 
Now the next thing I'm going to do here is just for extra style points, I don't particularly want this standard deviation to be 2.78 blah 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 blah, I'm going to want to round it just to maybe two decimal places. So inside the code here I'm going to write round in front of the stdev.p, I'm going to put a bracket so it's now going to round that bit of coding, I'm going to press comma at the end of it to three significant figures or maybe to three decimal places uh, and then press enter and then that will give me just the standard deviation to three decimal places and then I'm going to do exactly the same thing with this quartile one round and then leave the code in the middle there put a comma at the end and three and then the next one uh, that seems to have already done it so I don't really need to do that extra stuff there Right, so now do I need to type that in for all of these different columns here on all the other different spreadsheets? No. Let me show you a really helpful feature of the Excel spreadsheets. If we highlight all of these, no, right, just click on it, highlight all of this, uh, these uh, seven cells here, and then we hover over the bottom right of those highlighted cells till we get a cross, click, on, click and hold the cross, and then drag it across. Now what that will do is it will now calculate the mean, standard deviations, minimums, lower quartiles, medians, upper quartiles and maximums for the columns that they are now in. So that's quite helpful. What I'm now going to go through is now just tidy this up a little bit and delete any, val any rows, any columns where it wouldn't really make sense to have a mean of that column. A bit like this one here, it wouldn't make sense to have a mean of the Beaufort scale so I'm going to delete that column there. Visibility fine octars, that's debatable, but I suppose I could keep it in. Uh, this one here, daily mean pressure, that's got a lot of decimals there. I might just extra style points, just round a few of them off. Um, but daily mean wind direction, that's measured in a bearing. Mm, no, actually, that wouldn't really make sense to have as a mean or a standard deviation. It's just the direction of the wind. It's, it's nothing to really calculate a mean or a standard deviation of. So I'm going to delete that data there. The wind direction, that's just um, south, southeast, southwest, northwest, etc. That doesn't really make sense to have a mean of. And then if we scroll across a little bit more, then we have the cardinal direction again. Uh, for some reason and we'll delete that as well so we'll delete all of those and this is the daily maximum gust corresponding direction um, so no that's again measured in a bearing so we don't really want that mean either so we'll delete that one so there we are there we have now calculated the means standard deviations minimums lower quartiles medians upper quartiles for all of our data sets so the final thing I'm going to do here, just for extra star points, is I'm going to highlight all of these rows using the numbers on the side, and I'm going to cut them. You're probably thinking, why would we cut all of the work that we've just done here? But I think it would be more sensible to place all of this data at the top of our spreadsheet. So what I'm now going to do here is I'm now going to click on the number 7, right-click, and then select insert cut cells, and that will paste it above the cells that we've just got there. So I'll paste it in. And then if I just scroll to the left a little bit, it will give, give us our mean standard deviation, minimum, lower quartiles, medians, upper quartiles, maximum values. And what I might do as well is I might just insert an extra line. So I've right clicked here after selecting that row. I'll insert an extra line there just to make it clear that here is the gap. And then here is where it starts my data. And here is the mean standard deviation, minimum, lower quartile, median, upper quartile and maximum. OK, so what you've now got to do is you've now got to do all of these summary statistics here for Heathrow, Hearn, Leeming, Lichars, etc, etc. But I won't just leave you there. I'll show you how to do it nice and quickly. Uh, if you select rows 7 to 13, in fact, let's do 7 to 14, it'll include that little extra row there. And then we right click and click copy. Now, if we go into the next spreadsheet and select row 7, then we can insert those cells there. So right click and go to insert copied cells. Click on that and your new mean standard deviation, etc, etc, will appear for Heathrow um, in, in your spreadsheet. So that's really helpful. It's not going to it's going to prevent you from typing out all of those all that bits of code again. Uh, but it's also you can see it's clearly different. It's not just you're copying the cells for Campbell and into the Heathrow spreadsheets, you're copying the formula 
into this new spreadsheet where it will calculate the mean of the Heathrow data, not just transfer the mean of the Camborne data onto the Heathrow spreadsheet. So you can see there it's calculated the new means, standard deviations, etc., for the new data set, the data set on the page that it's currently on. So that's very helpful. OK, so now it's your turn to practice that skill that I've just showed you how to do there. And once you've done that, have a go at these questions that are appearing on the screen now. So pause the video now. OK, so the next skill we're going to develop is I'm going to show you how we can draw box plot diagrams using your large data set. OK, so I'm going to show you how to draw a box plot diagram for daily mean temperature from Camborne. Uh, now, I'm not going to use Excel to do this. I'm going to use an online package to do this. So I'm going to go to my internet browser, and I'm going to type into my internet browser www.geogebra.org forward slash classic hashtag spreadsheets. And I'm going to press enter on that, and it will take me to this page here. Now, GeoGebra is fantastic for all kinds of mathematical uh, software stuff, so graphing, geo geometry, 3D graphics, uh, good for probability distributions. But I'm going to use the spreadsheet mode, so that's why I've selected hashtag spreadsheets. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this graph on the right-hand side. In the top right, I'll click that icon there, I'll click some more options, and I'll close it down. So I've just got the spreadsheet mode open. Now, first thing I'll do is I'll write a title, which is daily mean, whoops, daily mean temperature for Camborne. Uh, 1987. Okay, and I'll just make that column a bit wider so I can see all of that. Lovely. And now I need to pr uh, now I need to copy my data into these cells here. So let me show you how to do that. If we go back to the uh, spreadsheet and we will select our data, click on the cell and drag down until you get right to the bottom. Right click, copy, go back to your GeoGebra uh, file and press Control V to paste. And there we are, we've got it in our spreadsheet now. Now, how do we make the box plot diagram? Well, what we'll do is we'll select column A, we'll go to the second option here next to the cursor button, and we'll click that one, and then we'll select one variable analysis. And once we've clicked on that, we'll give it a time to upload. And here we are, we've got a histogram as our first diagram here. Now, we can change this to a box plot if we select the downward item, downward arrow there, and box plots. And there we are, there's a box plot there. So that's quite helpful. But generally, we use box plots to compare two sets of data. So what I think I'll now do is I'll compare the daily mean temperature for Camborne and the daily mean temperature for Heathrow. So let's go and I'll go to the Heathrow spreadsheet and I'll select all of my data for the daily mean temperature from Heathrow. And I'll just go all the way to the bottom, right click and copy move back onto the GeoGebra file and I'll give this a title with daily mean temperature Heathrow 1987 and there we are now let's paste the data in there so select the cell right click and paste or press control V and there we are there's our second set of data now so let's draw both box plot diagrams, let's just close that one down there and we'll select both the columns, we'll go to the second option here and this time we want multiple variable analysis so let's click on that, give it a time to do its magic and there we are, we clearly have the two box plot diagrams there, the first one is for Camborne, the second one is for Heathrow and now we can do some comparisons of our data. We can see clearly that the daily mean temperature for Heathrow is going to be slightly higher than it is for Camborne and I would say that the temperatures at Heathrow are more consistent than that of Camborne. Yes, the range is different for Heathrow, the range is much different, but the interquartile range, I would say, is just a little bit smaller than the um, daily mean temperatures for Camborne. So there we are, there's how we draw two or more box plot diagrams using GeoGebra. OK, so there we are. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to pause this video, go to your spreadsheet, and have a go at the skill that I've just shown you how to do there. And once you've had a go, pause the video and give these questions here a go.
Okay, so the next thing we're going to move on to is using GeoGebra to draw a line of best fit and calculate the equation of the line of best fit using regression. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do the line of best fit on GeoGebra again. So what I've done here is I've set up a spreadsheet where I've copied over the data for the daily mean temperature in Campbell in 1987 and the column for daily total sunshine in Campbell in 1987. I'm thinking there might be some positive correlation between temperature and sunshine, so let's have a look. So what I'll do is I'll select the first two uh, columns there. Now why is there no data here? Well if we look back in our data set, um, we're going to see that there actually is no data for these values here. Remember there was an n slash a for that bit of data there. That's why we've got no data in those cells there. So what, this, what the uh, GeoGebra file will do is it will just ignore these data values there or you could just delete the data yourself. But what I'm going to do is just select the two columns and go to the second tool there and then I'm going to go to two variable regression analysis. And that will create a line of best fit for me. Uh, in fact, it won't create a line of best fit until I've clicked on one of the options. If you go down below where it says regression model, at the moment it's set to none, and it doesn't really look like there's any positive correlation here at all. I was expecting positive, but there isn't. If we select the little arrow and select linear correlation or a linear line of best fit, we can see there's a tiny bit of positive correlation there, a tiny negative, sorry, a tiny positive gradient. But, but not much at all. Okay, so, so that's, how we, um, that's how we do the line of best fit. If you'd like to swap over your axes, then there's the x to y axis there, which will just change over the axes from one side to the other. But there we are, that's how we do a line of best fit and how we uh, calculate the regression line. Now another couple of variables that I'd like to show you is on the next slide here, which is daily rainfall and daily uh, mean pressure. And let's have a look at the correlation between these two. Let's go and do a two variable regression analysis on these two. And we'll see that although at the start it doesn't really look like there's much correlation, it's mostly because they're all clustered on this left-hand side here. That's not because of any of the data being missing, but because on a lot of days it was either zero millimetres of rain or trace millimetres of rain, so 0 0.025. Let's again do a linear uh, line of best fits there. And you can see actually there's some significant uh, gradients there on that line of best fit and if we wanted to swap it the other way around we could see that there was a line of best fit there as well. So what this is saying is that um, when there is no rain the pressure is 1018 and for every millimetre of rain that falls the pressure is going to go down by 0 0.8 hectopascals. And looking a bit more further into it, this is what a barometer measures. It is a scale in hectopascals. You can see the hectopascal meter reading around the outside there. It's measured in millibars. And a low measurement on the hectopascal reading is an indication of rain. A medium value on the hectopascal reading between 990 and 1010 uh, measures a potential change between rain and fair or fair and rain. Uh, fair just means nice weather basically and if it's high pressure between 1020 and 1050 it's likely to be fair weather. Okay, so now it's your turn to use GeoGebra to calculate some lines of best fit. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and have a go at that then. And once you've had a little play with it, have a go at answering these questions that have now appeared on the screen. Right, so that's all we're going to cover if you're studying the AS Maths qualification. Thank you very much for watching. I hopefully you found this video helpful. And I hopefully you've taken the time to pause the video at the suggested points and complete the questions. You'll certainly get more out of the video if you have done so. If you'd like to do a bit more preparation for the large data set, I have two further hyperlinks in the description to help you. The first one is a link to a continually updated worksheet of suggested questions that I suggest you complete based on what I have seen appear in past paper questions. The second hyperlink is a, to a document full of past paper AS maths questions that make reference to knowledge of the large dataset.
You don't need to know each data value in the large data set, but have had experience with manipulating data, changing n slash a values or tr values from the large data set, and have an overall understanding of the different variables and have analysed some of the key statistics. Hopefully you found these videos helpful and hopefully you find the additional resources down below helpful. Make sure you click on the AS Maths ones and best of luck with your AS Maths exam. If you're here to study A-level maths then we're going to move on to two additional sections here. The first one being A-level maths, the normal distribution. Okay, so I'm not going to do too much with the normal distribution here, but I'm just going to use some histograms to see if some of our variables fit a normal distribution. Now, what does a normal distribution roughly look like? Well, it has lots of data values near the average and very few data values at the extremes, either low extreme or high extreme. So what I'm going to do here is just use the histogram mode. So I'm going to click on my data, click on the second option there and do a one variable analysis. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my bars a little smaller and see if it roughly fits a normal distribution. Now it's kind of fitting a normal distribution here. If I make my bars as small as I can, then um, yeah, there's very few data values near the uh, near the extreme values, but there's a and there is a lot of data in the middle. I wouldn't say it's a perfect normal distribution there. Maybe if you take a specific sample of our data, you might get a normal distribution. But roughly, yes, I suppose you could say that it has few extreme values with lots of data clustered in the middle. But I wouldn't say more data clustered in the middle than maybe one standard deviation away. Um, so it's kind of a half and a half there, really. And, and maybe that's what real life data is more like. Maybe real life data isn't a perfect normal distribution. Maybe we just use normal distributions to model real life situations. Okay, so it's your turn to now use the histogram modes to see which of our variables fit a normal distribution. So pause the video and give this set of questions a go. OK, so the next section we're going to move on to is calculating the product moments correlation coefficient for two of our variables using Excel. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do calculate the PMCC value between daily temperature and daily total rainfall. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so I've got some space on the side here to write my code. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do this for the June values. So let's just scroll down to those June values. June starts here and I'm going to be using this set of data here. Now just so I can really easily grab it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just grey out that data there so it's really clear which data I'm going to use. I'm going to use from the 1st of June to the 30th of June so I've got 30 data values and therefore I can do a hypothesis test because on my formula booklet I've got an n value of 30 that I can compare with. So I'm going to do the PMCC value over here so PMCC equals and then I'm going to do my code in the next cell. So I'm going to write equals and then the code for PMCC is actually Pearson, P-E-A-R-S-O-N. It's uh, the mathematician, it's a Pearson product moments correlation coefficient by the mathematician Pearson that calculated the formula for it. Now, in this case here, it says array one and array two. And what array means is set of data. So I'm just going to select the first set of data as my first variable. And I'll select that data there. That's my first selection of data. And then I'm going to go to the code line, press a comma, and then I'm going to select the second set of data. And there we are. So I've selected that second set of data. Using the code line, I'll go back up there and I'll close my brackets and then press enter. And that will give me the PMCC value. So let's just zoom in on that. That is a PMCC value of minus 0.09. Now that's indicating to me slight negative correlation, but I don't think that's going to be statistically significant if I were to do a hypothesis test on it. But there we are. That's the code for doing a product moments correlation coefficient calculation. I'll put it on the screen there now on the formula bar. It's P-E-A-R-S-O-N, Pearson, 
brackets, select your first set of data, comma, then select your second set of data, close brackets, and press equals. Okay, so it's now your turn to have a go at doing something like that. So pause the video now and have a go at answering these questions uh, on the screen now. Right, so that's it A-level math students, thank you very much for watching, hopefully you found this video helpful. Now same for you as with the AS math students, there are two hyperlinks in the description below. One is a continually updated set of questions that I recommend you complete, based on my experience of seeing questions that have appeared in the A-level maths papers, and I definitely recommend you having a go at those. The second is a document with all previous A-level maths questions that refer to your understanding of the large data set, and all of those questions come with hyperlinks to video solutions for all of them. So hopefully you found these videos helpful, hopefully the additional resources will also be helpful as well, and uh, yeah, thanks very much for watching everyone.